first scripture reading is from Corinthians 1, chapter 13, the gift of love. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Here is the reading. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The second scripture reading is from John chapter 11, verses 1 through 6 and 17 through 27. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God the one coming into the world. Here is the reading. Thanks to God.
morning again. It is so good to see you all, all of you that are here. I know sometimes when it is cold, it challenges us, or at least me. And so we have to push ourselves, even in a cold environment, to kind of enter into the space of worship, being present in community, and being thankful, and reaching out to gratitude, and hearing an inspirational message. Let us pray. Dear Lord, touch our fingertips and our nose, touch our hearts and our eyes, and allow us to hear a fresh word, an encouraging word, a revelational word from you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been doing the love series, and at the beginning of each sermon, each week, I've invited someone to share a love story. And today, uh, Carol Dean will be bringing us a love story. Let us hear it. It faced towards me as if to speak. 
stare directly at me. Although I could not see the face, the silhouette was a spitting image of my father's physique and height. His presence, his presence comforted me. I closed and rubbed my eyes countless of times to make sure I was not asleep and truly seeing this. Yet every time I would open up my eyes again, he would still be there. After a while, I became afraid, thinking that he may walk towards me and how I would probably pass out. This went on for possibly 30 minutes or more. I began to pray, and I prayed, and I prayed that God would take him away now, as daylight was beginning to shine through the room. I did not go to sleep that night, as I spent time with my father, silently watching over me until daylight. I was so happy and wanted to share good news with my mother who was downstairs. Yet, I was still a little hesitant about passing through that doorway. So, I waited for some time after his shower was gone before I got up to pass through the doorway. I took off running down the stairs. I skipped most of the stairs. I told my mother what happened. She called my grandmother, which was his mother, and told her about the experience. My grandmother said to me that I was his favorite. He missed and loved me. The all white clothing, etc. indicated that he was in a good place and that he came to let me know that he will be watching over me. After this experience, I became a believer that spirits do continue to live and may sometimes visit in person and or dreams after transitioning. And that after death, love never ends. For this, my life was changed forever. Thank you. She was in school. She was 
special. I mean, I know we're all special, but there are people that have a little bit of a super special kind of thing going on. And Eva was super special. She just had that way in her smile and in her being of mentally making room for people to sit in front of the room. She homeschooled her kids, so it was nothing to see her on campus with two boys walking behind her. And then Deidre got pregnant with a third child. And this pregnancy was a little bit harder, a little bit more complicated, even the birth. A month later, she was rushed to the hospital. They had used a coma to save her. And then she never came out of that coma. Deidre was the glue in many of her circles. And so when Deidre died, it left a hole on the campus. It left a hole in her family. It left a hole among her three boys. It left an absence with her husband. The enormity of her loss was felt. In the biblical text today is a story of three siblings, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, according to the author of the Gospel of John. These folks knew Jesus. Well, it kind of started out over in a group where Mary and Martha went through a lot of preparation to get ready for Jesus eating at their home. They knew each other by name, and Jesus had been in their home, well, at least once. They were believers. They were close to Jesus, and Jesus had a special place in their heart. John said so much that when Jesus was on his final circuit days, Mary took out a bottle of expensive perfume worth a lot of money, on Jesus' feet. And some people got really upset about that, wasting that perfume on Jesus' feet. And Jesus was like, hold up, back up. It's all good. Jesus went to back for Mary and Martha. This was not the family he was born into, but how many of you know sometimes the family can make it so strong? And so when Lazarus got sick, they use what Cody refers to as their circle of influence. You know, I scratch your back, it's time for you to scratch mine. And so they sent word to Jesus about Lazarus and about needing that scratch back. He had a reputation that Jesus for healing and miracles. And after Jesus had gotten word, he stayed two days longer before he made her his way to their house. So I need to break this down for you all. Jesus wasn't traveling in a personal $65 million jet. He wasn't traveling in a $450,000 Rolls Royce. He wasn't even traveling in a Chevy. He had a pair of cheap sandals, and he was walking step by step on rocky, sandy ground to his destination. So when Jesus waited two extra days, to pick himself up and start walking to his destination, it's significant. While Mary and Martha are waiting, Lazarus dies. They were sitting with fresh wheat. Word got out to Mary and Martha that Jesus was on his way, and Martha didn't wait. She jumped up and started walking and running, but she wanted to confront Jesus. Martha, the bold, more direct, in-your-face kind of person, walked up to him and said, Negro! <laughs> but I think that's what she wanted to say. <laughs> if you had been here, my brother would have died. Martha goes back to Mary and tells her, Jesus is asking about you. And Mary goes, and Mary's a little bit more tactful, so she touches Jesus and kind of says, Jesus, you know if you had a baby here, my brother would not be dead. Mary weeps, and all the folks gathered around her that came to give her support there weeping. And then Jesus weeps. Now that's one for the record. Jesus was touched, perhaps, by their pain. But what he's weeping for? If he had been here in the first place, Lazarus wouldn't have been dead. Rage is a part of this. If, 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 if. If is a powerful word that generally takes more than it gives and suggests that somewhere, somehow, someone acted in such a way that the consequences are irreversible. If you had just been here, Jesus, my brother Lazarus would not be dead. How hard is it to do what you say you're going to do and be where you're supposed to be? I mean, after all, ain't you Jesus? One Saturday, I was downtown in Marshalls. You guys remember Marshalls? Man, Marshalls was the store. I was downtown at Marshalls. I was in the basement, and they had an electronic section, and I was over there messing with the keyboards. On this particular day, I met a guy named Reginald, and me and Reginald talked. 
And those of you that try to bus can relate to this. The number six bus was taking longer than normal. No problem, I got time. And I waited. And I waited. This bus was really, really running behind. And then when the bus finally pulled up, two buses at one time pulled up. I hop on the bus, lets me off downtown. I run to the location where I'm supposed to meet Reggie. And he's not there. If, 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 if the number six bus had been on time, I might not do it for y'all this If is the simply slow, spiraling downward, that Martin Luther King referred to as the winding, meandering road of good intention that the good Samaritan found himself on that some say can lead straight to hell. Woulda, coulda, shoulda, I'm offended, it didn't. I'd give anything if only for that moment again. If the pilot operating the helicopter Kobe Bryant was on had just said it's too cloudy and decided to not go up that day. A Padilla had lingered after school walking through the park trying to catch the bus home from King High School. If only Michael Butcher Place Jackson had known how beautiful he was. If Sandra Glenn just had been talking back to the officer, if Jordan Davis playing his music to not a trade on the mountain, where would he get a game? If the church hadn't been silent for so many years on so many critical issues, by the time we did speak, nobody was listening. If the Pharisees hadn't been so threatened, if Judas hadn't betrayed Jesus with a kiss, reminding us that not everyone that gets in your space is your BFF. If Lot's wife hadn't looked back, if God hadn't preferred Abel's sacrifice over Cain, if Adam and Eve hadn't eaten on the truth. If, 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 if is a house that resentment filled. There was a fist that held one bound. There was a gate that kept others out. There was a heart that turned to stone. This was a house built, but it ain't a home. A glove, and once new and a dream long ago, the walls are colder and black as gray. Of once holding on because they can't let go. Living in the past on a bed of ifs, can't get up when it's time to go. If the word it takes, it takes, and it takes, and it takes, we laugh and we cry and we break and we break. If there's a reason that we stand by inside, And we never got the moment. We never got the moment. Let it go. Let it go. We didn't go see the movie. Frozen. Let it go. Let it go. Instead of leaving, we decided to stay living in a house that rage and resentment filled. If Jesus just had been there, things would have been different. You have to find yourself dancing with you. I'm not making light of tragedy. I'm not making light of your sorrow. I'm not making light of sometimes your bad days. I'll bring your good days. I'm not thinking like that Lazarus was just here and now he's gone. Like that person was just by my side that I love so much and now they're gone. I'm not making light of all of this. I'm not making light that sometimes life stinks and sometimes we struggle with full blown documented rage. But this is all I got for you today. Two days after Valentine's, find some sugar or honey to add to life. So that you don't become resentful, bitter, bitter. Find sure because the text today reminds us that love ain't bitter. Love is not irritable. Add some sugar to the bitterness of your life. I know some of y'all like your tea and coffee without sugar, but sometimes, sometimes you got to sprinkle a little bit of sugar on your brain. On June 28, 2015, Rakia Abdul Mutakalim lost her son. He went out that night to the ATM about 9 o'clock to get some money to get some food for his family. As he returned from the restaurant with what money he had, three of them were shot in the back of his neck. He died the next day. We hear this story too often. He was a Navy man who had gone to the military after 9-11, returned back home and decided to live in South Cummingsville against his mom's wishes. Why did he need to live in that neighborhood? But he said, Mom, you raised me that we are to be alive. And two years later, he would be discovered on the sidewalk bleeding. Only one of them was arrested, 14-year-old boy. The other two have never come forward. And the boy, the 14-year-old boy, has not talked. Rakia, if she continued, if she continued to hold on to the pain, she would become bitter. If 
she continued to hold on to the pain of losing her son, she would become resentful. These boys had snatched her son's life way too early. If he had followed her wisdom and not moved into the ghetto in the first place, if, 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 for Rakia says when she saw this tall, burly boy that looked like a man in the court, she could only do one thing, and that was forgive him. She now hugs Javon Coulter like he's her own son. She believes every kid is born with a light in their eye, and it's society's job to make sure that light stays there. For Rakia, she still cries over the death of her son, but forgiveness is her sugar. Maybe the sugar for you is kindness. Maybe it's volunteering. Maybe it's donating to a cause. Maybe it's joining the Illinois Council Against Handgun Violence. Maybe it's registering people to vote, because we got to vote. 46% of our population did not vote in the last major election. Maybe it's painting beautiful signs like the beautiful project all over the city that says you are someone special. Maybe it's fixing day, maybe it's fixing dinner for your neighbors across the street. But for me, you know what sugar is? Sugar is love. Love is my sugar. So that even when I'm busy and my son wants to give me that hug, that love is sugar. Uh, Nina Baker said it more correctly, sweet love. Y'all know that? So sweet. So sweet. So sweet. Sweet love. I got your back. You got mine. We are in this thing together and like very Thank you.